It must be somewhere, Miss Roper. You'll, you'll, you'll find it in a minute. If not, you can borrow Mr. Milo. Does Milo seem to have He's a spare, is he? Right. Okay, right. Uh, so, now, Mr. Milo, where do we go to next? Well, good morning. Um, I was going to leave the issue of uh, Miss Roper's um, freestanding power under Section 16 uh, for an injunction to her to deal with. Our position um, clearly set out is uh, your position in w &M, my lord, from uh, 2012, that there are two clear powers. Under 47, where there is no decision that has been taken under Section 16.2. Just a moment. You're saying the trust position is what you're saying is my position in w &M. Yes. We'll come on to that if we need to. As? Yes. Uh, so where no decision has been taken and no order made under six, Section 16.2, um, then an injunction can be granted under Section 47.1. Where the court has reached a decision on P's behalf and made a 16.2 order, then it may also, where it considers it necessary, or expedient, um, grant an injunction to give effect to that order under 16.5. Trust needs to go no further um, in order to succeed before you, we would say. Uh -huh. To the extent that there might be a tension between the wording of sections 16.5 and section 37.1 imported by section 47. Um, I said yesterday, my lord, that we thought that was likely to be a distinction without a difference, and in particular where one reads in the overriding objective and the requirement to take decisions justly, which is a really, if there was a critical word missing from 16.5, then that's it, um, then the suggestion that there is no practical difference between the two tests, um, I think, is made good. My Lord, moving on, if I've got, if I can take you to the, the roadmap, and there may be parts of this which require less time spent than others. Um, section C is the second appellant's ground to three, that there was no best interest evaluation. Can I deal with that by reference to the judgment in the core bundle at tab 10, um, it's beginning at page 107? What is abundantly clear is that this judge who had case managed this case from 2018 ran it through a five-day hearing in December 2020, had it for a uh, media hearing in February 2022, and then had a further three and a half days in June, was completely focused on G's best interests. And that is clear. I, I don't take you to the original December, I think I said 2020 judgment. Um, it should have been December 21. I don't take you to that. But it's made clear in paragraph 1 on page 107 at line 4. He says in December 21, I delivered a judgment setting out why it's in G's best interest to be transferred to a specialist care home as a step down measure to, uh, to moving her to her parents' care. I was entirely persuaded that care home provided the most appropriate environment for G, and that given that she'd spent most of her adolescence and the entirety of her adulthood to date in a children's hospital, an immediate move home um, would be inappropriate. And he cites the expert evidence in support of that. Um, Paragraph 2, below that, six lines from the bottom of paragraph 2, a couple of words in, after the words in hospital, the important evidence that all agree that a hospital environment, particularly a children's hospital for this 27-year-old woman, is entirely inappropriate for G. I'd go further because it needs to be single, uh, signaled entirely unambiguously that G's continuing placement in this hospital fails to afford to her the respect for her dignity as an adult that she, like everybody else, is entitled to. Then page 113. 
paragraph 18. Despite the decision in December 2021, in which he'd anticipated, made clear earlier in his judgment, that she would be moved within eight weeks, so by February, paragraph 18, he said, she's not moved to a care home, at line two, she's languished in a hospital environment which I have denounced as contrary to her best interest for a further six months. And then page 122, line four, sorry, uh, paragraph 48, line four. As to the frailty of the care home option, on the fourth line, he says, I've heard evidence that if this placement were to be lost, it would take a very considerable time to identify another, and it's unlikely it would be in the locality. And then this being important, because this judge wanted G to have contact with her parents, and the identified care home was the closest to where they lived, and the least likely to cause them inconvenience. Thus, it would mean that if that was lost, this young woman would have to stay for many more months in a place everybody agrees is entirely unsuitable, the hospital and potentially move to a care home which risks limi limiting her contact with her parents. None of the family have confronted that dichotomy. And then in, over the page in paragraph 50, dealing with the injunction including uh, the mother and grandmother, um, plain therefore that both uh, M and N are not entire, only entirely supportive of the father's campaign also likely to become embroiled in the execution of a plan to derail the placement. I'll return to that in response to other points. It's for this reason I've come to the conclusion that the injunctive relief sought in respect of them both is entirely necessary. And the fact that necessary includes the words in her best interests and necessary follows from the decision in December, the very strong desire, the commitment to move her to a care home where she could be provided with adult care, not paediatric hospital treatment, which she no longer requires. It's absolutely clear that this judge had a laser-like focus on G's best interests, and we reject the submission um, made by the father that he did not evaluate her best interests when imposing the injunction. Yes? Moving on to D. This is the mother's ground that it was wrong to grant the injunction against her in the absence of material evidence against her. Lord, I start by um, reminding myself that yesterday afternoon, my Lord Lord Justice Nugent made the point, this is an appeal court, um, and you'll be slow to overturn findings of fact made by the judge below. And one would expect that, that any enthusiasm that this court might have for overturning findings of fact would be tempered by the experience that the judge below had and the direct evidence that he heard. In that regard, it's highly material, not only that he had extensive experience of the case due to his case management and the numerous witness statements supplied by the father, but that he had heard evidence from the father and mother extensively in December, and that he'd heard evidence again, this is in respect of the mother, he'd heard evidence again from her uh, in the June hearing, and the opinion that he formed of her, having seen her written evidence and having heard extensively from her, is set out in the core bundle in the judgment of paragraph 46. And it's a passage with which, my lords, you will already be familiar. Uh, where he says, and it's six lines down, I skate over the point that is made about not being able to find glasses. I accept that she may not have expected to give evidence. I don't read anything into that. But having heard extensively from her, this judge formed a clear impression that she simply doesn't want to engage with the evidence and that her support for the father was complete, blind, and unquestioning. And then moving down to the last lines of paragraph 47. Before you leave 46, I ask you this. Oh, yes. Um, the judgment seems to suggest 
says her name is included on the correspondence to the care home. Um, but we were told on her behalf that, in fact, it was only one email. Can you clarify that? Lord, I can't um, immediately. Can I come back to that and give you an answer? Thank you, Lord. I'll come back. Is there anything else arising in relation to paragraph 46, or can I take you to 47? Um, looking then at 47, having um, made his views clear and setting out in great detail the extent of the mother's social isolation. Um, line four, at the end of the line, he describes the routine of going to the gym having fallen away, and in response to the judge's own inquiry, he revealed that in the 14 years that G had been in the hospital, she'd never been out, she, the mother, had never been out on her own to meet a friend for a coffee or a glass of wine. Um, she very rarely goes into the hospital. And then coming down the page, I think it's 11 lines from the foot, the judge's conclusion, having had the experience of listening to all her evidence, I'm struck by what I regard as M social isolation, largely impervious to the outside world. And this is important in connection with the control or the um, cooperation between mother and father. Her environment consists almost entirely of her partner and daughter. I don't intend any of this should be interpreted as a criticism. It's not. It is, however, the illustration of the type parameters of the world that this couple has been living in for so long. Um, there is no issue arising in this case upon which the mother and the father are not in total agreement. No light and shade. Mother gives her partner 100% support on everything and her hostility to the care home is every bit as strong as his. In August of 2020, um, and he then deals with uh, the disruption and allowing the father mm. onto the ward when he'd been excluded. Can you just tell me where that comes from in the evidence? My Lord, that was... Um, I've spoken to Miss Roper about that, and there was evidence available in terms of logs, I think, about what had been reported. I'm not sure, and I, I'll uh, ask Miss Kirk Bride for the page references um, in relation to the witness evidence. So it was in the, in the statement of Miss Roper, is that right? No, sorry, no, Miss Roper, who, sit, who sits alongside... Oh, sorry. Um, I'm I think okay. there, there was evidence available. I'm not sure at the moment entirely where that that was, but again, that's the second point upon which I'll return to. Thank you. Forgive me, my lord. I may be able to answer that more swiftly than we could. Yeah. My Lord, there is, you will recall that there were eight nurses who had initially provided anonymised evidence uh, to Nurse T. Of those, three then provided statements of their own. One of those, who I think was Nurse G, gave live evidence, the other two being unavailable because they were on night shift. And it came out in the evidence of that nurse in... Um, no, so it was Nurse G when she was giving live evidence in response to uh, Miss Roper's question. So that would only appear from the transcript, right, which we don't have. Which we don't have. Right. Well, Lord, that was the having, as I say, taken extensive evidence from her and formed that view about her blind allegiance to the father. Uh, and the shared desire, the drive, and the determination that she should come home. That was the view that compelled the judge in paragraph 50 to conclude um, that both the mother and the grandmother were entirely supportive of the campaign. And essentially, if they were not included in the injunction, then they would become proxies for uh, the skirmishing that had continued and derailed the placement so far. I'm sorry, could I just... just tie up that evidence about um, M in relation to August 2020. Presumably that was then put to her when she was cross-examined. My Lord, in the 
hurried discussion on the bench. I'd understood it had been raised with um, the nurse and with the mother. I, because I wasn't present, I'm in some difficulty. Just wondering whether she accepted it. Do you mind if I defer to Miss Roper since she yes, was there? Yes, perhaps. Yes, or My Lord, I don't know if I might assist as counsel for um, Em, who was also there. Um, she, she did accept uh, in evidence that there had been an incident in August 2020. The nurse, Nurse G, her statement is uh, at page 173 of the supplementary bundle. I don't want to say her name for obvious reasons. Um, she mentioned the reference in passing. Um, her evidence was that of, of the nurse supervising rather than as, as the nurse who was present at the incident. The evidence given by my client and subsequently by her husband, and there was some criticism of me rightly at the time that I hadn't pulled up the nurse to cross-examine her on it. Part of the problem being because of the late service of, of the papers because of the late joinder of my client. There was no written evidence from my client that said he didn't pull it up. But my client accepted an evidence that there had been an incident, it was that the context of the incident which was in dispute because the, the evidence of my client was that she had been on the ward when her partner had been excluded, having taken their daughter out uh, during a, a period when they had been told that they shouldn't because of COVID, which they had disagreed with, uh, and that she had called her husband, her partner, when, when she had been told that she shouldn't have. She said with the agreement of nurses because her daughter was in distress. So, so her case was that she called him because her daughter was in, in distress rather than for any other reason. Um, thank you very much. I'm not sure what led the cause of Ms Roper's uh, recollection, but the, po the point is, that, as I understand it, the, the judge has made a finding and, and there's no appeal against it. Uh, I really, really just wanted to know where he got it from. Um, so I'm not sure that there's any dispute at the moment that the judge as, as the judge's findings in that regard. Am I right in that? Lord, I, as far as I'm aware, there's no dispute. Thank you. Lord, thank you. Can I move on then to um, paragraph E, which is the uh, third appellant grandmother's ground. Yes. The court was wrong to make findings against her without requiring those to be particularised in advance. Um, and the starting point for an analysis of that is what was she aware of in general terms or what should she have been aware of? And it's the supplemental bundle, tab 2, page 14, and paragraph, it's put, as you might expect, very generally, tab 2, paragraph 14, sorry, page 14, paragraph 19, is the trust's position statement, where Ms. Powell submitted that the evidence demonstrated a very clear need for the imposition of a behavioural behavioral framework if the placement was to remain open. To Julie. Yes. Um, because unless the framework was applied to both the mother and the grandmother, uh, it was likely... Yes, well, we can read that. Yes. Um, so that was the starting point, and the, the grandmother would therefore have been well aware that what was being said against her was that um, she was effectively likely to carry on the same campaign. That was on the basis of what would have been the evidence of the nursing staff beforehand about her disposition and her manner towards them. But things changed substantially during the hearing. Because Can, before you move on to that, the position paper is dated 7th of June, which is the day before the hearing mm -hmm. starts. There must have been some process by which um, the grandmother was initially apprised of the fact that an injunction was being sought My lord, I know that. Do you mind if I just turn my back? Lord, on the first of June, she was served with the paper by the trust. What? What was she served with? With um, an injunction order, the terms of which I can. You mean a drop? A drop. An application notice. Yes. What you would expect. Indeed. Do we have that? And it's not in the bundle, is it? It's not in the bundle. We do have a, a copy because your lordship was asking yesterday about the, the terms of the order that, or the draft that she was yes. supplied with, and also the terms of the final draft. And we have a copy of that 
um, which okay. we can well, at the moment provide. Can we focus on my Lord's question is with what was she served with on the 1st of June? With what was she served? Just while Mr. Melonis is taking instructions on that, my Lord's may I just say the, the COP9 application for the injunction is in the core bundle at page 155. Core bundle. Yes, my Lord's. And it's, as uh, I say, a C attached draft order, but the draft order does that not then follow the application okay. notice. But that's the uh, the application notice that my Lord or Justice Nugent is, I think, alluding to. Okay, but that it just tells us to. And but that says at one five seven that evidence is attached. So do we know Lord, what evidence? Uh, is? Can I just I don't. I do now have a list. I don't want to breach the confidentiality. So can I do it by reference to? Um, if I can take you to the table of contents of the supplementary bundle. Yes. And identify the tab numbers of the uh, witnesses whose evidence was provided. Have that contents page. Yes. Uh, there was uh, the COP9, the draft order, and then these witness statements. Uh, the 11th of April statement of Nurse T, which is at 12. Uh, tab 12. Uh, the 26th of April statement of uh, tab 13. Yes. And the statement of Dr. B of the same date, which is at tab 16, at the statement of uh, tab 14, the statement at tab 15. The tab, so it's, it's the 12 to 16? Yes. And where we, do we have a copy of the draft order that was served with the application? My Lord, I can, can I pass up now the uh, Can I offer this? To, I can give you a copy of the draft order, uh, but what may be of more assistance, if you don't mind hearing closely at the smaller font that appears, there is a copy that Miss Kirkbride has compared on the um, version I can hand up in red, you will see the text that's been added and also the text that has been deleted. Some of that, for reasons I don't understand, is in a much smaller font and is a little bit harder to read, but it's, it's quite right. clear. Have all the, has what you're giving us now been disclosed this morning or just confirmed this morning with the other, with other parties? Uh, my Lord, it hasn't. Forgive me, it hasn't. Well, have you got a copy that you could show... Uh, Immediately, Mr. Brownhill, and also Miss uh, Cohen and Miss. Uh, I think it has reached some. Of, I think it had reached some of my colleagues, but perhaps. Okay. All right. So what I've got is a an order with the word draft in red underneath, which is otherwise unamended. And then a heavily track change document, um, so what are these two documents? So that is the draft order that was provided within okay. the uh, bundle to right. the grandmother. Uh, that, can't, that can't be right, can it, because it refers to a, oh no, sorry, forgive me, I'm getting confused. All right, before we go any further, Ms. McKendrick, Ms. Kern, and Ms. Brownhill, are you content for us to look at this without uh, further interruption? Uh, I think on a, on a Devani essay basis, my Lord, and so I'm clear that these are the right documents. But yes, at this stage, my Lord, yes. Yes. I hope they're the right documents. Yes. Um, so the one with the word order in black and draft in red underneath is the document which you say was served on Mr. Brownhill's client. My Lord, yes. And presumably everybody else. The, the other respondents. 
yet. I only hesitate because I don't know the date on which that was served upon the others. Well, but yeah, there's a nod two rows back. Well, the application. The application is dated 26th of April. You take this to at 155 to 158. Is that right? Well, that's what it says, 158. Yes, my lord. Notice doesn't identify the respondents, does it? The notice doesn't. I think, my Lord, it, it doesn't identify them by name, but it does say that the behavioural support plan is supposed to be implemented. That would well, where, 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 are you, where are you looking at? I'm sorry, I'd have to put it away, but it, it does say, I think, in um, box 2.1, parents and paternal grandma are to be yeah. bound. But but it doesn't it name yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't, but yes, it does yes. say that. Yes. It doesn't say who the respondents are to the proceedings. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So then, so is it your, are you asserting that this document was appended to that application? My Lord, yes. And uh, this may not matter, but it appears from that draft order that at this stage, neither the mother nor the grandmother had been joined as parties to the proceedings. Is that right? So, uh, my Lord, that does appear to be right from the title. Although the order is directed, if you look at, at paragraph 2, is intended to bind the parents and grandmother. At some stage they must have been added to the proceedings. I don't know what the procedure is. Lord, yes, I'm afraid I'll have to defer to others because I don't know well, what the chronology of the joinder was. So if we just... Uh, yeah. The, res the three respondents listed at the top of the draft order are G, the father, and the CCG, as it then was. Yes. Neither the mother nor, nor the grandmother. <laughs> this draft doesn't anticipate... Well, it refers to the parties being represented in B, in B of the expansion notice being the, the, opponent, the applicant and three respondents. <coughs> um, I think the first reference to the grandmother is paragraph two of the order at the bottom of the second page. Is that right? My lord, it is. Um, but in the first, in the last recital at G, it's implicit that she is uh, and one of the other family members referred to. It would be wholly contrary to G's best interest if the conduct of the father and or any other family members is permitted to jeopardise the placement at the identified care home. Followed okay. by her being named as you've identified in paragraph two. Well, without being pedantic, um, G at one stage, I don't know what position now, would have had at least would have two, two grandmothers. Oh, yes. But um, and surely, and some it will be <laughs> to be expected that an order would include somewhere a reference to the name of the person against whom the injunction was being obtained. My Lord, yes, I, th I think sometimes in terms of the, the drafting, particularly where uh, some courts have different approaches to the naming of, of the parents, either using names or referring to them as the mother or the father, um, and that sometimes follows through into the drafting 
whoever was responsible for preparing this. I don't think there was, it was clear who was included within right. it. And this, we're only looking at this because to consider the point of fairness to the grandmother. Oh, yes. So this application was dated the 26th of April. This was the draft that was attached to the application. Mm -hmm. And we've been told the notice was served on the 1st of June, in five weeks later. Yes. Five, eight days, seven days before the hearing. Yes. And it was emailed. I think I understand there were difficulties getting contact details, but it was emailed in May. I'll find the, the date on which. To who? Was, was it emailed to the grandmother? To the grandmother. Was, the, was she represented at that point? She was represented. I don't believe she was at represented. Point, was she? No, my lord. Um, and she is, I, in, insofar as her being on notice that it was her conduct that was um, going to be restricted, that's made clear in paragraph four. Where although she's not named, she was the only relevant grandmother, and that would have been very clear to her. I mean, an order like this, which could have anonymised parties, should have a schedule somewhere attached to it with, with the uh, identities of the anonymised people made clear. That's what happens in these orders, isn't it? So it happens in reporting restriction orders, My Lord, yeah. which it, these follow. It, it should have done. But Reviewing it now, there was clearly no doubt, and that this grandmother could have been in no doubt. There was no other grandmother who was, uh, I'm not even sure if there is another living grandmother, but it was clear um, to the grandmother that she was the one whose conduct was being restrained. You've told us what this first document is. What, what is? Are you going to tell us what the other one is? Look, I'm, I'm, I will do. That's this document, which has um, a lot of red annotating. And green. And a bit of green. Anyway, right, yes, go on. Your Lordships. So this yes, is I've seen the green on. This is a track change document. It's a track changed. In fact, I think it's a compare right document. Um, taking the second document tonight, uh, identifying in red micro font um, additions and deleting, but leaving um, clear by strike through the changes. I'm afraid because of the title, it moves to the, the third page. I don't know why like, some part of it is in green. Doesn't, I don't think there's any material difference between those. The, the first material change is on the second sheet uh, where the penal notice. Well, the first material change is that, is that the title includes the mother and grandmother as fourth and fifth oh, respondents. And then in the order, there's a penal note. There's a penal notice directed to the three yes. adults. Yes. Well, what's the answer to my lord's question? What is this document? So that that shows the changes because that were made between the copy that was served upon the grandmother, indeed upon the parties, um, in June. The beginning of June, and the final order that was made by his lordship. Right. Because if there was a very significant difference, and one that was a change in the terms of the order that did not appear to be justified on the basis of the evidence that had been heard by the court, then your lordships might think there had been some unfairness um, for the grandmother who was unrepresented. I don't intend 
intend to take your lordships to any of the detail here, apart from the penal notice to which I will come in a moment, or the reasons for it. Uh, the rest of the changes are such as, uh, such as might be imagined after there has been a hearing and there's been fine-tuning to the way in which conduct, whether it's in terms of treatment provided or behaviour responses when trips are taken. Um, there's just fine-tuning of those provisions. So there is nothing here, we would say, that visits unfairness on the grandmother um, as a result of changes during the hearing when she was unrepresented. Can I just clarify? There were many there were existing proceedings with existing parties. There must be was some originating process at some point. Um, I don't know what the position is under the Court of Protection, but at some point, would there not have to be an order that a new party can join the proceedings? My Lord, there would be that the Court has power <coughs> to grant. Uh, to join parties to proceedings, and I can um, take the Lordship to the provisions uh, if necessary, but if it's required to do so uh, in order to properly manage the case and, and deal with the case. Um, you're right as to the originating process in this case, but the history of it, I, and I don't recall the exact year, is that proceedings were issued, I think, in the mid-1560, uh, and by 2018, the judge was concerned about the delays, and then with COVID there were further delays, uh, which resulted in a, a hearing, a final hearing that only took place at the end of December 21, and it was only, I think, as uh, things became a bit more pressing, that the involvement of the grandmother became more apparent, uh, particularly in February, when it became clear that she was the one who was in charge of the social media aspect. <coughs> But then the, there's an application within the proceedings made in April, but not served on her until seven days before the hearing. My Lord, yes. The, the short instructions I've had on that is that there were difficulties finding a place to serve her. Uh, in, to, to serve her electronically, and that's why um, eventually she was served in the unit. Why couldn't she have been served by the uh, phone? Lord, I'll, again, I can take instructions on that. I'm, I wasn't involved in the case at that time, so I'm not aware. So but all that was done was an application was issued within the existing proceedings, which sought relief against the grandmother didn't actually name her as a respondent. Is that right? My Lord, I think that's right. I've just been, in relation to the service upon her, I've been passed a note um, indicating that on the 18th of May, the father refused to provide details. I'll just check. So we didn't have a physical address for the, for the grandmother and the father refused to provide uh, an email address. That was followed up again on the 24th of May, and then on the tw by the 27th of May, we had been provided with an email address, and it was emailed to her. What I'm slightly trying to understand, though, is that there's, a, there's, there's proceedings to which the grandmother is not party. Then there is an application notice at 155, how, how, does, how does the grandmother become a respondent in the proceedings? On what basis was she before the court? My Lord, I can see Miss Roach is offering to help me in my moment of difficulty. Can I defer to her? Uh, only because I was, I was present. There is a separate order which joins both the mother and the grandmother. There is, is there? there is. <laughs> Where is it? Um, and when was it? When was it? It's there were there were two. There was an application received. I, I may not have the full details. I would expect. My On whose system. application was the were um, they joined? But the grandmother filed a COP nine application for 
asking to be drawn. Okay. Um, All right. Um, so that was a copy of that that I have, which has got her name at the bottom. What was the date of that? It's dated the 8th of June. 8th of June. Okay. And the mother? Um, the mother of a Hyde acknowledgement of service, I believe, also seeks to be joined. And the date I have for that, I think, is somewhat earlier. <coughs> Well, I'm imagining she. I'm assuming she was, she was served earlier. Just Cone standing up. Yes. Uh, my lord, my instructions are is that she was not served directly. It was only when um, uh, my instructions solicitors came on the record on the 30th of May. Okay. They got papers. But there is one order. I have it here. I can have it printed in the chamber. Can Thank you. So, so just May, trying to move this. June. I'm sorry. Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, there's one order dated the 8th of June. Upon reading the COP9 applications on behalf of the proposed fourth and fifth respondents, which would be the mother and grandmother respectively, one the proposed fourth and fifth respondents join the party to the proceeding to be made in the COP9. Okay. So the position is this: upon receiving the applications at different points by different methods, both the mother and the grandmother applied to be joined under what I've discovered is COP Rule 9.15, and that those applications were granted by separate order. Thank you. So they joined on the first day of the hearing. Yeah. But the grandmother asked for an adjournment. I, I have to say, I, I, I don't recall that. I'm not saying it didn't happen at all. I, I, I simply, I think, that's I, what I think what there is some reference by. to it. Can I, before anybody else responds, can I say I, I have seen some uh, of my solicitors' notes of that hearing where a question was put to Miss Powell as to whether there was a request for an adjournment. Um, and Miss Powell um, assured the court that we appeared to ask those in court whether there was a request for an adjournment, and there didn't appear to be one. That's gleaned from uh, a note of the day of the hearing. Can I, if anybody else has better evidence? I have a very clear recollection, um, but I will need to go and check my solicitor's notes of the hearing, that either the judge himself or his clerk told us that a request had been made by the pro bono advocate for an adjournment because they were not available for the hearing on the 8th and 9th of June. But that's just my recollection and it may be wrong and I will have my solicitor check the right. notes. But the difficulty is if that took place with the judge's clerk, there may not be a note of it, and we have to rely, I'm afraid, on my faulty memory. Um, well, was that a, that was presumably by an email, an email to Justice Hayden's clerk? I, mean, I, I cannot remember if I was speaking to Miss Addington outside of court, or I, I'm going to need to check my instructions list as notes. All right. But that's my recollection that it was put on the basis that the pro bono advocate wasn't available. For the grandmother. For the grandmother, my lord. And I remember, and the reason I remember it is I thought it was an ambitious application on the basis of non availability of counsel to adjourn a hearing with so many people involved. And that's why it sticks in my memory. But quite who said that to whom, in what circumstances, I just don't recall. Okay. Or maybe not so ambitious by somebody who'd only, who'd only just been joined that morning. My lord, that might be right. It, it wasn't. wasn't that might be right, but it wasn't my concern because I had many other issues to deal with. Um, but yes. Well, might it be a technically, technically, and couldn't even necessarily have expected her to obtain representation before she was joined? My Lord, yes. And they were joined on the morning of the hearing of the 8th of June. And I, I can find the correspondence if it's necessary. I'm not sure that it is. But I remember when I saw the application at the end of April, I said to my instructing solicitors, has it been served on the, on the grandmother and the mother? And my solicitors had to write to the trust solicitors and say, are you serving her? What's happening? They need to know about this. And there is that correspondence. But, uh, OK, well, we'll move by straight. Let's, let's, can we have copies, please, of the documents Ms. Roper told us about, the applications to be joined and the order joining them from somebody? At some point, not now, but at some point very soon. Yes, now, Mr. Malonis, where are we going now? Well, that the we were taken to that because I had said there was a significant development. Mm -hmm. um, 
in March, and the development in March, insofar as it concerned the grandmother, uh, played out against the context of the judge's decision in December as to uh, the best interests move to the care home, the father's application in February for the reporting restrictions order to be lifted, the care home's concerns arising because of the father's engagement with On the 7th of March, the judges is uh, handing down judgment, rejecting the father's application to lift the RRO. And then on the 21st of March, uh, the email, which is in the supplementary bundle at tab 15, page 162, received by the Priory. Well, if I just yeah. leave you all to read that, and in particular also to read what is referred to, um, I think, as our press release at the bottom. assumption was that this, because it was in very much the same tone as the correspondence generated by the father and directed at the same end, was that this had been prompted because of a conversation with him. And it was only during the oral evidence of the grandmother, I think, where it was dealt with by the father, who said that he'd only sp spoken informally to this lady. We have only spoken informally. It only became clear during the grandmother's oral evidence that she had spoken to and had an ongoing relationship with this former work colleague. It was not a relationship that resulted in... The person, the author of this letter? Yes, the, the PR consultant. And the grandmother suggested that uh, this lady had offered to help. She had no contract with her. There had been no payment. And she said that she had not authorised this letter to be sent. She was cross-examined by Miss Powell about that. Um, she accepted that she had seen the email and that despite having seen what was said in the opening line about this consultant having been appointed by the family of Nikita Roberts, and despite the tone of the email, she did not speak to the PR consultant, the corrector, or in any way to take issue with what was said there, whether the tone or the subject matter. The grandmother denied that the text at the bottom of the email was a, a draft press release, even though that's identified in the body of the email. And all of this came out in front of the judge during oral evidence. It was clearly very relevant evidence. And it clearly could not have been particularised in advance because nobody knew that she had uh, been responsible for the contact with the consultant. Uh, the wording of the email was absolutely explicit as to the family's views and the clear intention to go to the media, notwithstanding the fact that only a fortnight earlier, the judge had been absolutely clear that the reporting restriction order was not to be lifted. Um, and indeed, it included the press release we've set out at the bottom. And the clear aim 
was to Banjak, the placement, which was supposed to have taken place on the 8th of March, but had been vacated because of ongoing concerns to a date in April. And the evidence before the judge volunteered by the grandmother and her witness evidence was that she ran the Get G Home and G's Story pages on social media, which posted numerous images of G, including speech attributed to her um, with hashtags Get G Home and hashtag Home Not Care Home, and so on. So when the judge uh, delivered his judgment in the injunction hearing, he had all of this substantial information before him. It was entirely appropriate for him to take that into account and to conclude, as he did, um, that the grandmother, having already been involved in, even if there had been a mistake, which he thought unlikely, even if there had been a mistake, um, she had been the communicator with the PR consultant who drafted the 21st of March, uh, of March email, and in those circumstances it was entirely reasonable uh, to include and necessary to include her in the injunctive relief that was sought. So in the circumstances, she was put on general notice uh, by the position statement, which we accept she would have had only brief sight of, but she would have known because she has been intrinsic as part of the family support group for G throughout what behaviour was restricted by the order, what she could and could not do, uh, and she would have known that the efforts of her son were directed solely at preventing the transfer to care home. And indeed she accepted in her own evidence that she wanted G to come home and not to go to the care home. So in those circumstances, it was entirely reasonable for the judge to take the view he did about what she would probably do if she was not restrained. And the fact that there was no uh, particularization in advance of the hearing served upon her, did not do her any injustice. She was able to respond in questions to um, counsel and to the judge. She would have been able to provide any reasonable explanation of her actions. So there was no other. Was there any consideration given as to whether there should be an interim order with a further hearing to it uh, after she had had a further opportunity to consider the application? My Lord, I, I can't, there's nothing that I've seen. It doesn't seem that. to have been suggested by anybody, no. Oh, this is, the order in place is effectively a final order for 12 months. Yes. Yes. So, my Lord, in those circumstances, although on the face of it, without the, the very important context of the judge's findings and her own evidence about her commitment to G coming home, and in particular her, con her contact with the PR consultant, and the tone of that email, together with the fact that this was not something sent off that the grandmother did not have sight of, she saw it, and if it was truly sent without any authority at all, and sent in a tone that was completely unexpected to her. Well, your, your point is that, 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 that on the evidence which was put, uh, ultimately adduced before the judge, or given to the judge, he was entitled to make, make the order he did. Hello. Does that deal with E? It deals with E, and that moves on to F, uh, which we can address by starting with Mr. Brownhill's skeleton, which is in the core bundle at uh, page I don't think we need to hear you on the Protection from Harassment Act point. I'm great, grateful for that. Um, can I move? I'm assuming that doesn't deal with the, the whole of this point. Well, go on. But only because uh, at paragraph 8, in addition to the protection of uh, harassment, uh, Mr. Brownhill suggests that the Court of Protection doesn't have power to regulate um, the appellant's contact. We've covered this in our submissions before. Yes. Uh, Section 16.5 clearly gives power 
uh, having suggested that it doesn't have the power to regulate the appellant's contact, um, there is no uh, reference material supporting that assertion, and we would say that uh, preventing the sort of contact that is prevented by this injunction is exactly what is envisaged in order to um, make an order that has been taken under Section 16.2 effective where a party's communication with somebody who is responsible for providing care to P um, might derail the placement. So there is nothing unusual at all about it. Uh, one other point made by Mr. Brownhill is that this deprived um, the grandmother of the, the uh, defences of reasonable, um, uh, objectively reasonable views and providing her objectively reasonable views. Clearly, it didn't do that. She was able to explain to his lordship why she was doing what she was doing, and she had every opportunity in court um, to provide a reasonable account of the basis for her actions. And she did that. She said clearly, effectively paraphrasing um, what she had said and echoing her son's views, that she wanted and would do anything to get um, G home. Um, G, which is uh, the father's point about the weight to be placed on, anon on, on anonymous or hearsay evidence, um, starting with Mr. McKendrick's skeleton, which is in the core bundle at T4, page 52. He starts with a quote from uh, Boyd and in communities, and firstly in relation to the anonymous information in the opening lines of the um, quote of Lord, from Lord Justice Thomas, and he says, of course, the reasons for wishing to give evidence anonymously require careful scrutiny. And that was a, po a point that Lord, um, Lord Justice Phillips made yesterday, which is that as a result of the um, behaviour that he's set out in a number of the statements, um, it might be thought that the reason for them wanting to be anonymous was obvious. And his lordship deals with that later in the judgment, and we'll come to it. At the bottom of that paragraph, uh, Lord Justice Tomlinson says, at paragraph 136 of his judgment in the Moat House case, and Lord Justice Brooke observed that there the large volume of hearsay evidence presented the judge with an unusually difficult problem. It might have been better if he'd started his analysis, his judgment, with an analysis of the direct oral evidence which he had received and made more transparently clear his approach to the evidence. And with respect, that's exactly what um, the judge did, did, did in this case. I have a large number of references in the judgment where I can take you through the weight he, or his consideration of the direct evidence of the father, of the clinicians, of Nurse T, before weaving into that. And he made it clear at the beginning of the judgment that he couldn't deal with the anonymous and hearsay evidence in isolation, and he made clear at the end that it was against the context of all the other evidence that he had to place that evidence. Uh, but taking the point very shortly, unless I need to spend more time on it, it was clear that he um, did have a very firm um, framework of direct oral evidence upon which he could uh, make his findings, and that on top of that direct evidence, he considered the uh, hearsay evidence which by then was limited to only five witness statements um, of nurses who were anonymous and two who were, had rel relinquished the anonymity and had given statements but had not been able to attend. Um, in the circumstances of the case, given all the evidence he had available, um, there was more than enough direct evidence to found the conclusions he reached and his uh, attribution of weight to the hearsay and anonymous evidence was entirely reasonable and certainly we would respectfully submit not uh, wasn't such an unusual exercise of discretion as to allow interference with it by this court. Right. Does that complete your submissions? My Lord, it does. Can I just deal with one um, outstanding issue, which is in relation to the trust? You asked yesterday what, uh, which trust now yes. had responsibility. Yes. There is no single trust that has responsibility. Um, there is a multidisciplinary team of clinicians from different trusts. From different trusts. From different trusts. Um, none of whom have yet been involved in these proceedings. 
Right. Well, that does that point doesn't directly arise on this appeal, or that, that, that but if there are heritage court further court proceedings, um, that some consideration have to be given to that. But I don't think it's something for us. But it's not simply substituting one for one trust. No. That will be the issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Willis. Now, Ms. Roper. Thank you very much. Yeah. said he was supportive, the trust is supportive of the position, but he was leaving it to me to develop the argument. Um, and, and in large part, it's set out in our skeleton, and I don't propose to repeat anything that's in the skeleton unless you wish me to do so. Uh, is it right that before the judge, the position was that, uh, that Section 16.5 did not provide, your position was, Section 16.5 alone did not provide uh, the route for an injunction? Um, well, I don't, I don't feel comfortable, and the official solicitor would not say that that was clearly our position. Uh, we, we filed, the position was that um, we set out our written submissions in advance of receiving any of the other submissions, uh, largely to assist for various practical reasons. Um, and so most of the response to Mr. McKendrick's submissions and Ms. Conn's submissions were therefore dealt with orally. Um, and as always, the official solicitor went last after most of the argument had already been um, right. dealt with. I have gone back over my notes and, and those of Ms. Baker to see precisely what we said. But looking at the exchanges at the law and also con consulting my own faulty recollections, the exchanges that we had orally about the law uh, were on other matters other than those being argued. Well, the judgment, Mr. Milonis has suggested, by reference to the judgment, that the focus of the argument was on the points raised by Mr. McKendrick, principally about the, the scope of Section 16.5, uh, and uh, not on the overall fundamental test, which was a matter which wasn't contested before the judge, and to which Mr. Malonis, that being the reason Mr. Malonis says, why there's no discussion in the judgment of what the test was. Um, well, it was argued in, in closing, certainly by Mr. McKendrick, that Section 16.2 was confined to a decision that he could make for himself and that Section 16.5 was confined exclusively to what the court powers that the court had when appointing a deputy. Um, and on those two points, our submissions were as they are now. Firstly, that the, um, that the ambit of Section 16.5 is not confined to deputyship. And secondly, that the scope of Section 16.5 goes beyond what decisions he can make for himself. Uh, and that we argued by reference to section 17, the non-exhaustive list. Yes. Particular I mean, I, I, of course, have well, we have those points. I, for my part, I don't think so, I, we need, unless other my colleagues disagree, we don't think we need you to um, expand on those. Our point was that section 17.1b is a decision he can make for himself, and therefore a decision to be made under section 16.2. Section 17.1c is not a decision he can make for himself for the reasons that Lord Justice Newtree 
uh, yes, um, much better okay. than I did. No. And so, and so that was in terms permission under section 16, vote 17, for the court to make an, for the court to grant an injunction. All right. So, th having cleared that away, where, where, what is your position about the legal test <coughs> about the legal test for injunction? Um, it remains as it was then, but it is much more clearly thought through uh, with the benefit of some time and consideration, which is that there are two routes under which the Court of Protection can grant an injunction under the Mental Capacity Act, one of those being through Section 16 and the other one being through Section 47 and its incorporation of the powers of the High Court, including Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act. And what we say about those is that e each of those sections um, affords a gateway to a rather of different orders, including in each case injunctive relief, but not confined to injunctive relief. When you say there are two gateways, can the court, is it your case that the court can do anything under both gateways, or that it can do some things under one gateway and some things under other gate, the other gateway? The latter. So right. um, we, we do, as, uh, as we've referred in the skeleton, we refer to um, your case of W and M, in which the, the bulk of the argument was addressed to a reporting restriction order, um, but during the course of which you said at paragraph 23, um, it, it may exist by... by yes, well, should, we look at, should we look at it? That, that is um, a case to which Mr. McKendrick took yesterday, yeah. not this particular paragraph. Which bundle is it in? It's the authorities bundle tab um, 38. Three. essentially the lobby about a, the court's power to make a reporting restrictions order. But in the course of that judgment, at paragraph 23, mm -hmm. uh, you said, in addition to the general power to make injunctions arising by virtue of section 47, the provisions of section 16 and 17 of the Mental Capacity Act 2005 give the court of protection express jurisdiction to make an order prohibiting a named person from having contact with the provider. The court is satisfied that such an order is required in his best interest. And as was canvassed before you yesterday, and I think you got the point that that is uh, an example of an, uh, an injun injunctive relief which could be granted under section um, 16 that is exemplified in section, section 17. But it's that that is not an exhaustive list. Um, the, the remainder of that judgment deals with the balancing exercise to be applied when granting a reporting restrictions order. Uh, and we would say that a reporting restriction order can only be granted under Section 47. So very briefly on section 47, I don't think there's any dispute between those before you that that does accord to the Court of Protection all the court powers of the High Court, including the power to make injunctions. And it will probably be, be more helpful if I, if I explain our submissions on section 16, which is the narrower pathway to a particular type of order, including injunctive relief. What we say about section 16.5 is that that is a, um, that, that opens the gateway to make orders to give effect 
to a prior Section 16.2 order, we say it is ancillary to and therefore to some extent parasitic on there being such a prior Section 16.2 decision made on P's behalf. Well, that needs yeah. to happen before. That's how, it's, that's how it's structured, isn't it? Yes, and we would say that that we would say it should be applied as how it's structured and how it naturally reads. And that that section 16.2 decision needs to have been made before the gateway of section 16.5 opens. You could do it all at the same time. Yes. Yes, yes we're, we're it, it, there wasn't a chronological point. That was a, that was, that was a logical point. It, 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 it's a, yes. It, it, it don't would, need two sequential orders. No. Uh, no, you certainly don't. You don't need two sequential orders, but we would say you do need to start with a, yes. with a decision being well, made. What, if I may say so, Ms. Rivers, that's absolutely plain from the wording, because all you can do under Section 16.5 is make an order to give effect to the decision in Section 16.2. That's what Section 16.5 says. Um, yes, my Lord, and I'm, I'm sorry to labour the point, but it doesn't appear to be accepted by all those in, in front of you, and that's why, that's why I do so. So we would say that the sequence... Possibly it is. Yes. This, we would say that the proper sequence is that, um, firstly, the, the, of the process by which one gets to Section 16.5, but firstly, um, the, uh, we've set that out in paragraph 47 of our skeleton. I don't think I need to take you to it now <coughs> to say, set out the root map of what would happen. Firstly, the court would identify the relevant matter in relation to which a decision needs to be made by or on behalf of P. Secondly, the court determines whether P has capacity to make that decision, and if P has capacity, that's the end of it. Thirdly, if P lacks capacity, then the court makes the decision on P's behalf uh, yeah. and in their best interest. That is a Section 16.2 decision. Mm -hmm. Do you accept that, I, I think it's common ground, because I think Lady Hale said this, that, that decision, the 16 decision is simply doing what a capacitous person could do for themselves. Yes, my lord, we do. We would say that that decision is confined to a decision that P can make for himself. Uh, we would say that how that is done, and again, I don't think this is controversial, is that the court applies the best interest checklist in section 4, but that is not an exhaustive checklist. So where I would part company with Mr. McKendrick is I would say that is a non-exclusive list of the matters which D, the decision maker, has to consider when making a decision on behalf of P. That's four, you say? That's section four. four. Then, yeah, that's because it says um, that you all have. relevant circumstances, and yeah. in particular, uh, subsection two. Yes. Um, and in, in particular, on that point, there is nothing in the wording of Section 16 or the wording of Section 4 which excludes consideration of third party rights and Well, interests. what Section 4 is, is about is about identifying what is in P's best interest, making a de deciding what's in P's best interest. Yes. Yeah. And so when making a 16.2 decision, the court has to has to apply that best interest checklist. Yes. Um, but in the process, the court also needs to consider the rights and interests of any other person. Although that's not expressly included in section four, it is a relevant circumstance. Yes. It's partly a relevant circumstance because the rights and interests of other people are a matter which a capacitous person takes into account when making a decision. Well, there may be a difference between rights and interests. I mean, clearly, if I'm a capacitous person and making a decision for myself, I have to, if I'm going to act lawfully, take account of other people's rights. To ignore other people's rights may, may be not acting properly, but do I have to have regard to other people's interests? Not quite the same thing. No, I, I agree there's a difference between a legal right and uh, 
and an, and an interest. And so the example that your Lordship gave yesterday was of the co-owner of the house. And, and you, I, I think I'm right in saying that you distinguish, you provided two examples of the co-owner of the house um, and also minor children who, who don't have any proprietary right to the house but are living there. Um, and equally, the, there might be a carer who has no proprietary right. We would say that where there's a, where there's a legal right, neither the capacitor's person can ignore that, nor can the court ignore that. And that, that might, in appropriate circumstances, require um, entirely separate steps to be taken um, outside the court of protection to deal with those. Relevant circumstances are defined for what it's worth in subsection 11 of section as meaning A, of the, which the person making the determination is... Do you have this? Do you have the whole section, section 4? I'm reading really yes. yes. section 4? Yes. Got section 4? So I... Page 9. I should have... Page 9. Okay. Section... Ele, subsection 11 is... It says, relevant circumstances are those A, of which the person making the determination is aware, and B, which it would be reasonable to regard as relevant. Yes. So you would say that in the example that the Lord raised and we were all picking up on, the interests of a minor child also living in a property well, is a circumstance which would be reasonable to regard as relevant. Of course, my Lord. Yes, we would certainly say that. Because a capacitor's person would consider them relevant. That is a different question from how much weight the capacitor's person would afford to, those, uh, to that circumstance. Brutally, the more selfish the capacitor's person, probably the less weight they afford, afford to the interests of another person. Yeah. Um, so we would make that as a general point, but as a strengthener, and specifically in relation to the, uh, the convention right, of third parties, uh, that is a matter which the which the Court of Protection expressly takes into account when making a best interest decision on behalf of P. Uh, and I apologise for bombarding your lordship with paperwork. It was an authority I hoped we would not have to include, although it's referred to in our skeleton. But I think I probably do have to take you to it. That's the case of LBX in this court. Okay. We're going to hand that up now, are you? Thank you very Keep much. My name, my name. Um, just while, I, while we remember, the structure of the, the structure of the Act is that Section 4 sets out the approach to be taken to best interests by all decision makers, not just the court. Yes, my name. And it, yes. it includes the court. Yes. All right. So you've handed up LBX. LBX, briefly, is a case in which it was argued paragraph 11 that the judge had been wrong not to take as her starting point in making a best interest decision on behalf of P the article rights of both P and her family members P at that stage living with sorry, he is a man P at that stage living with their family <laughs> And the leading judgment in that case is given by Lord Justice Thorpe, who refers that this is territory that was um, trod yesterday. Paragraph 18 refers to the Human Rights Act mm -hmm. and says that paragraph 19 that gives rise to the familiar test of necessity and proportionality. And it was then submitted, as, as you can see at paragraph 20, that, that essentially that you shouldn't, the court should not 
get onto making a best interest decision unless it had first sorted out the question of competing rights and interests. That submission was rejected. Okay. Um, and was said to be not made good by the authorities and too crude at paragraph. So 30. the authorities Mr Armstrong took the court through included M M, -M and Neary. All right, so where's the ratio, where's the, the meat of Lord Justice Falk's judgment? Paragraph 35, my Lord. Is that it, as far as Lord Justice Falk is concerned? Um, it, it's mostly it, although in paragraph 36 he then sets out a, a substantial length the, um, the actual judgment below of Mrs Justice Mrs. Tice, Tice, which okay. he considered was impeccable. And, and, and as can be seen from that, she factored in at her, her paragraph 103 into the balancing exercise the family life that L had with L. And actually, if you'll forgive me, I'd just like to read the first part of what Mrs. Justice Tice said about it. What did Lady Justice Black say about this? At paragraph 56. Lady Justice Black also rejects the idea of a starting point and says that the balanced consideration of all the circumstances and attention to what is required by Article 8 is all that is required. We say that that is how the court, as we, we said, that should not be controversial. That is how the court goes about making a decision on behalf of P under section 16.2. Um, right. The court makes that decision by making an order under section 16.2, and that is typically um, where P might live, who P might have contact with. In, in the order that was made in this case in December, um, which I think was handed up to your lordships yesterday, the two specific decisions uh, that the vice president made on G's behalf were to consent to the removal of the central venous line and to accept the discharge to the care home from the hospital which she had been offered. Yes. And of course that may be all that is required, but again, sometimes it is necessary to go further, and at that point the court may then make further orders to give effect to its Section 16.2 decision, um, and those orders are made under Section 16.5. That order, those orders, we say, are not in themselves decisions made on P's behalf. They are ancillary orders to a decision made well, well. on P's behalf. You say on P's behalf. Do you mean 
decisions which P could have made. Is that what you mean by that? Yes. So we say a Section 16.5 order is not a decision made on P. Or is not, does, is not confined to decisions yes. that could be made on P's behalf. Yes. It is not, com it is not confined to decisions made on P's behalf. Yeah. And that, that also occur accords with the wording of Section 16.5 in contrast to the wording of section 16.2. Well, if it was a decision, make a decision on P's behalf, it would be a section 16.2 order. Yes. So it must be something different. Yes. So, um, yes, I, I, I think I would say that in theory a section 16.5 decision could potentially be one made on people's behalf, but there's no, there's no reason why it should be. And, and mostly it wouldn't be, it would be a section 16.2 order. Um, so the types of order that can be made under section 16 generally are exemplified in the non-exhaustive list in section 17. That includes 17.1c, a prohibition on a named person contacting P. That is in distinction to the decisions about contact which P can make themselves, which are set out in section 17.1b. So our, su our submission is that it, although it is, it, it is, and we would say should be obvious from a reading of section 16.5 on its own, it's also confirmed by the list of powers that are exemplified in section 17, that the court can make an order prohibiting X contacting P under section 17, and that is an, that is an injunction. Right, so the order. fact that section 17.1c is an order of an injunctive character indicates that the, amongst other things, indicates that section 16.5 extends to injunctions. Yes, ma'am. And my, my lord, you raised the question yesterday whether a penal notice could be attached to section 17.1c. Yes. Um, my Lord, I, have, I think we have got copies of the COP rules if you need them, but it is COP rule 21.9. Right. I found that yesterday, I think, in my private reading. There is part of Grand Appeal Notice, section 21.9. Well, 20, uh, part 21 of the... Part 21. Part 21 of the Court of Protection Rules deals with enforcement. 21.9. for appeal notice before one can go on to enforce it. Yes. Um, and we would say it's plain, plain from that that a penal notice could be attached to an order, an order made under section 16 as exemplified by section 17.1c would be of an injunctive character and could have a penal notice attached to it because there is nothing, nothing to say it cannot do that. Okay. Um, we say very simply that none of that requires any reference Seven or section 37 of the Singapore Court of Section 91. We're talking about, talking about um, provisions in one single act, both 47 and 16.5. And there's no doubt that the act, the provisions read together, give the court the power to grant an injunction, or the protection, the power to grant an injunction. So the, the fine tuning of whether an injunction is under 16.5. 
seems to me doesn't matter in the slightest unless the test is different. Uh, and I'm not sure whether you are saying it is or is not different. I'm not saying. I, I, I would, on, on that, we would agree with the position of the Trust that it is a distinction without a difference because any order made under Section 47 or six, Section 16 must be, uh, must be a just order made according to principle um, that is set out in the overriding objective and it is, would be hard no, to the end argue of the day, that the court, any statute gave the court... At the end of the day, the, the Act grants, gives the court power to grant an injunction and the test is uh, that of just and convenient. Um, so does it really matter whether it's under 16.5 or 47? Well, it may not, and, and for the last however many years the Mental Capacity Act has been enforced, it, it has not been fleshed out. And typically, as in the SF case, what judges have done when making an injunction is to refer to Section 16, sometimes Section 17, and Section 47. Um, as Mr as Justice a kind of Ian did in uh, yes. yes, But what we have tried to do, given the net way that the appeal has been framed, um, is to go through at somewhat tedious detail the provisions of the statute to say this is what we think is permitted. I suppose the only possible difference, the reason for bringing in Section 37, Section 47 and Section 37 and 81 Act, is that it puts on a statutory basis the requirement for ju justice. But when it, has anybody got to say that to realise that really is a... Uh, Pedantic point. Um, because justice is... The court shouldn't do anything that's not just. It, it is impossible to conceive of a statute that gives the power of the court to make unjust orders. Thank you. There must be some problem <laughs> if, if anyone can find it. Um, the, the last stage in the, in the roadmap of what can happen under Section 16, if I, if I may, is simply, and I only raise this because of Mr McKendrick's submission yesterday, that Section 47 is the enforcement provision, is that finally, if an order has been made under Section 16.5, it, it has an appeal notice properly attached in accordance with Part 21, and it is not complied with, then the court may, of course, proceed to enforcement, but we say that is a separate and sequential step after a Section 16.5 order has been made. Right. As to how the jurisdiction under Section 16.5 is, is exercised, we would say, and what the test is, then it, it's, it's clear from the wording of the statute it has to be necessary or expedient. Um, section 16.5 is also pursuant to Section 16.3. It is subject to Section 1 and 4, and therefore the power, powers which are being exercised under Section 16.5 do have to be exercised in whose best interests. Again, I would not have thought that would be controversial. And generally that will not pose a problem because most Section 16.5 orders are made to give effect to a best interest decision properly made under Section 16.2. Ms. Uh, Ms. Conn gave the example of, uh, of an order that might potentially, on our case, be made under Section 16.5 but wasn't in whose best interest. She gave the example of a care home. Um, I, I insert the word into her submission irrationally because I assume that's what she meant, um, suggesting that his family couldn't come within 100 miles of the care home. Um, and if there is no rational basis for that, it is unlikely to be in Pete's best interest to make that Section 16.5 order, and it couldn't be made under Section 16.5. But on a proper analysis, we would say that is because um, if that is the position, it is unlikely that the original Section 16.2 decision would remain in Pete's best interest if it, would, if it were subject to such a condition. So it is possible to imagine of sequential orders that were so, so had such a material impact on the original decision that as to require the judge to revisit that decision. On that point, as we've briefly mentioned in the skeleton, 
it's a, it is abundantly clear from the Vice President's judgment that he did consider the question of whether it, whether it remained in G's best interests to go to the care home. And for the reasons we've set out there, he clearly concluded that it was even more imperative that she move and move soon than he had thought in his mind. So your interpretation of the judgment is that paragraph, is it paragraph um, nine, nine, nine is to be read without, it's as, as it reads. Section 16 provides a, whatever the phrase he uses. What's the adjective? Entirely cogent. Entirely cogent. I've only got the adjectives about Mr. McKendrick's submissions in my mind. I can't remember the <laughs> entirely cogent framework for the granting of injunctive relief. That's that, yes. there, there's no need to go through the tortuous process of yesterday afternoon. It's it, it's as it it's 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 what was although from, from what Mr. Malone says it may not have been what everybody put in their skeleton arguments for the judge. That's what it read. It, it, he meant what he said. Um, yes, my lord. Well, we certainly say he was he was he was entitled to reach that conclusion. Um, and and the official solicitor does not ask that the judgment be read in any other way, and would say that it's not sort of contrary to principle to have to, to to read a judgment with a context which is not going to be available to anyone else reading the judgment. So when one reads sixteen five, it it says. That um, was the word. Um, it says the court may such make such further orders, um, etc., as it thinks necessary or expedient. When one's interpreting what that means, one looks can look at section forty-seven and see that the court of protection has all the powers of the high court. So when you interpret what orders it can make. You know it has all the powers of the High Court, so I'm not sure really why there's any why it's any need to, to to read these separately. You read the provisions together, and so when you're reading six sixteen five, you look at forty seven. You say what orders make orders. You say well, if there's any doubt about that, what orders can it make? It has all the powers of, of the High Court. So, oh. so why 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 don't why do we need to to differentiate? It's all read seamlessly together. Well, that would certainly be an alternative interpretation, my lord, and it's not one that we resist, and we be, we be, we would be happy with that interpretation. Well, it's and not an alternative. It, it wouldn't lead to any different outcome. It's the way that you interpret a statute. I beg your pardon. It's the way that you would interpret a statute. Is that is, you'd read the provisions together. Um, you don't read one section of a statute <laughs> <laughs> and ignore the rest. That would be an interesting process. No, my lord. So it's, I'm just simply putting to you that I think when it says uh, may make further orders, uh, in case there's any doubt about what orders the court may make, section 47 clarifies it has all the powers of the High Court. So it seems to me that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Well, I don't resist that on the basis that I say there is, there is then no difference in how the law would be applied and it is that it would be acceptable and, and right in principle for the judge to reach the conclusion as he expressed yeah. it. In so, the and you're in saying judgment. that, you, you are presumably acknowledging that there is no material distinction between necessary and expedient with the implied assumption of justice being required as well, on the one hand, and just and convenient on the other. Uh, Mr. Yes. Kendrick sought to argue, I think Mr. Kendrick sort of argued that expedient was a lower bar, a lower hurdle to get over well, than convenient. Um, it, it may be that he does. We, we would say it's hard to identify any sensible distinction between expedient and convenient. Or, or um, between necessary and expedient on one hand, and convenient on the other. Section 16.5 is necessary or expedient. Oh, good point. So there isn't, there isn't a requirement of necessity. There is only a requirement of expediency. And under Section 47, there is a, quam, a requirement of convenience and, and indeed justice. So we would Again, say that there's, there's so many difficulties. We would say that is a distinction without a difference. 
it's very difficult to grant this because what, what section 16.5 says it can make such further orders as it makes necessary or expedient but when you look at what orders it can make we know that an injunction has to be just and convenient so it, it will make an order that it thinks necessary or, or expedient and one of the orders it can make is an injunction which has to be just or convenient so I'm not sure why again it's, it's any difficulty over this well I'm I wouldn't resist that on the basis that we say that that would um, that that would not have if he had expressly said at paragraph nine I refer also to par to section forty seven and so I know I have power to make an injunction it is just in, it is just just in convenient we, we say that uh, there was no need for him to do so and that it would not have made any difference to the outcome well. Should we just go on in? Are you going to say anything about what the judge says can after paragraph nine? Can, can I just before we leave that, just pick up my Lord's point? The thrust of the argument you're facing from all three appellants is, is that the problem with identifying section 16.5 is giving a separate power that is not, not just, as my Lord, Lord Justice Phillips has suggested, cross referring to the Section 47 power and hence to the Section 37 of the Supreme Court Act, is that it doesn't necessarily bring in all the jurisprudence as what you need to do before you can grant an injunction, which there is a great deal of authority on, most of which we've been furnished with in the bundle, um, as to what that phrase just and convenient really means. And after a great deal of elaborate discussion in the authorities, we've ended up with what Lord Leggett has told us most recently in the Privy Council case. And do you accept that whether it's a free step, what you call a freestanding power, or whether it's an incorporation by reference of the Section 47 power, you still have to bring in that jurisprudence as to what is required before the court can properly grant an injunction? Because if you do, then the argument really becomes irrelevant. And if you don't, then there is a real point which we've been able to grapple with. Well, as to what, as, as to the vast amount of jurisprudence which has been provided to your lordship from the authorities, one thinks that the majority of those, and certainly I think the most, if not all, of those raised by the appellant, are are raised in the sphere of commercial injunction. And um, while we would not say that all of that is necessarily is irrelevant for consideration, we say that the, it doesn't require express reference to that jurisprudence when making an injunction in the court of protection um, because it is not necessary because of the proper test to be carried out by a court making an injunction. Um, in any event. So we would say that whether whether applying section 16.5 or section 47, what the court has to do is consider not only P's interest and P's best interest, but to take into account the rights of any third party. We, we, cert we, we would certainly ag agree, the doesn't, doesn't back away from and, and agrees with Lord Leggett's proposition that there um, that there should be a, a, an interest which merits protection. Um, yes. But, but if there isn't an interest which merits protection, it's hard to imagine how an injunction would come to be considered, nor can it, nor would we say that there is any possible basis for saying that she had no interest which merited protection in this case. Well, that's why I wanted to go on to consider the next little bit of the judgment, because it seems to me that relates to the point that you've just been debating with my lord because what Mr. McKendrick seems to have been saying is that the power, according to the judge the power of the to grant injunctions was uh, prescribed or restricted by the case law so that um You couldn't 
restrict, use an injunction under the Mental Capacity Act to restrict, uh, to, to govern behaviours in the context of hospital or care home, paragraph 10. And the judge, we see the way the judge rejected that. Yes. But if we just bring into play Lord Leggett's work, Um, instead of what the judge said in paragraph 15. What Lord Leggett says is that there has to be an interest that's capable of protection. Yes. There doesn't have to be a cause of action. It doesn't have to be a legal right. There has to be an interest which is capable of protect, which requires protection. Yes. My, my Lord, the, the, the position that was argued below was a much more simplified version of yes. what has been argued well, before you. I'm and glad from the judge's point of view that that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and the way, uh, I don't want to mischaracterise what Mr McKendrick said, but the way I understood his argument was that he was saying there had to be some legal or equitable right which had to be identified. Yeah. He did that by reference to um, just, just, my Lord Justice Just Hughes. Lord Leggett open in front of us. This is a broad idea. It's not the par it's paragraph. Tab 20. 20. No, tab 20. Tab 20. It's paragraph 52. 52, thank you. I'm not flagged. The there we are. The need to identify an interest of the claimant which merits protection and a legal or equitable principle which justifies exercising the power to grant an injunction. So the interest in this case is <coughs> G's the decision that it's in G's best interest to move to the care home. And the legal principle justifying the exercise of the power is, is what's in section 16. Yes, my lord. I, we, we would say it must be the case that, in, in terms of the legal or equitable principle, it must be the case that the decision, a decision of the Court of Protection reached, properly reached under section 16 2 of the Mental Capacity Act after a proper best interest process taking into account the checklist in section 4, everyone's third party rights, um, all competing arguments, not appeal, and enshrined in a section 16 order, that must afford G uh, some, some interest which merits protection. Yeah. And the legal and, and equitable principle, just to hear what my Lord said, which justifies exercising the power, is the principle we find in section 16.5, which says one of the circumstances make your section 16.2 decision effective. Yes, my lord. And that is just an example of a broader principle in the law that when courts make orders, they can make ancillary orders to ensure the orders they make actually are, are complied with. I mean, the, the, the classic example is if you make a freezing injunction, yes, my lord. you can make a disclosure order so that, so that the claimant, the applicant, knows what the assets are which are frozen and can monitor whether they've been dissipated. That disclosure or disclosure of assets is not based on some cause of action. I mean, in general, you don't, you don't have any right to know what other people's assets are. But it's in order to make the freezing injunction effective. And Section 16.5 seems to me does exactly the same, which is you can make ancillary orders which are designed to make your Section 16.2 decision effective. Yes, ma'am. Speak for myself, it seems to me to fit directly into Lord Leggett's language in, in 52. My Lord, we, we have no issue with that construction. It's much neat, more neatly put than my own. But it, it's at that point, but I wonder why, why we are bothered about whether the order is made under Section 16.5 simpliciter or under Section 16.5 bringing in section 47 and hence section 
37. I don't see why, why you're shying away from that, because I don't see that the section 47 route poses any problems at all for the way in which you want to put the case. That may be undue deference, because I, I, I only shy away because of the way the appeal is and because of what is said about the language of the judgment at paragraph yes, 9. I have no problem in principle with the, submission, with, with the position that a section 16.5 order uh, pro provides the relevant legal principle on, on, on which the court can grant injunctive relief and that there is no, then no, uh, no substantial, no, no difference between the just and convenient test and the necessary or expedient test. When one considers the whole way in which an injunction has to be uh, has to be determined, it's, it's what, what we do say is that it is wrong to say that Section 16.5 would uh, would permit the court to make an injunction solely by reference to key best interests without considering the rights of other parties. And the case law that I've referred to in um, in the skeleton, which I won't take you to unless you wish me to. There's a case of TA. Um, there's a case of Lady Justice, uh, she was then Mrs. Justice Eleanor King. Um, mm. All those cases are cases in which injunctions have been granted. Similarly, all the cases in, in, in my skeleton and in the rather weighty authorities bundle made under the inherent jurisdiction, those are all cases in which injunctions have been granted. Um, for a protective, this is a protective jurisdiction, they have been granted to protect the, the process by which the court gets there is to identify uh, that P is someone who requires protection, to consider the measure that is proposed, which is an injunction, and to consider whether it is necessary and proportionate to achieve the protective effect that the injunction is imposed. And in on a word search, but I am 99% sure that in none of those cases is there express reference to the terminology of just and, con just and convenient. Overwhelmingly, the prism through which the courts approach this in the inherent jurisdiction and in the court of protection is through the wording of necessity and proportionality. And we say that having regard to the competing rights which tend to be in play in cases of this nature, that is the appropriate way of doing it. Thank you. Does that complete your submissions on the legal test? Uh, I, I think so. Um, that does complete my submissions on, on the legal test, but if I can, <coughs> can make one specific point on the facts of the case. Yes. The approach of a court to the balancing exercise and considering the competing rights of other people will of course be intensely fact specific yeah. and in the TA case for example um, and in the HM case, it's the Israeli case um, Sir Jonathan Cohen and, uh, and Mr Justice Mumby as in will both have, the, have an intense focus on the, the rights of the third parties which were being vigorously asserted. Because in those cases, what was being done to the third parties was essentially draconian. In TA, TA the family member was being excluded from their home, prevented from coming within 100 metres of the home. They were being uh, banned from communicating with the local authority more than once a day. There was a limit on the uh, email which the length of the email which could be sent and it was not to be circumvented by providing attachments. They were only permitted to communicate with the official solicitor once a week. Um, those are draconian steps. Similarly, in the HM case, uh, there were wide-ranging freezing orders and then orders permitting use of the frozen money um, to bring proceedings in a different jurisdiction. And they were ex extremely wide-ranging. Um, in this case, the injunction essentially provides for a transition from a pediatric model of care in which 
inevitably, the voice of the parent is heard loud and clear and often accorded immense and overwhelming deference. A transition from that, which was essentially not only an inappropriate and unnatural position for a 27-year-old woman to be in, one in which the Vice President was found was actively compromising her wealth, to a adult model of care in which care is provided mainly, though not exclusively, by professionals, and in which family members, usually by a relatively natural process, resume their status as primarily family members rather than directive carers. The family in this case are not being prevented from doing anything they could reasonably demand to do. They have no inherent right to provide care to their adult daughter. They have no inherent right to visit late at night or to voice their complaints in a manner likely to lead to withdrawal of a proposed placement. And we ask the court to bear in mind that on the other side of the coin was what was at stake for G, who had been stuck in a paediatric hospital for almost a decade after attaining her majority in a situation which the Vice President vividly described in his judgment, which had become increasingly inimical to her welfare because of the entirely dysfunctional relationship which had developed. That was a factual situation which was not essentially posed by disputed by any of the parties. It's a situation that has arisen regardless of whose fault it was. From the official solicitor's perspective, it didn't matter whose fault it was, but it did matter that it was very important to get G out of that position as quickly as possible. And the Vice President also had in front of him evidence at the hearing in June that any of that if that if G uh, if G was not moved to the proposed care home, the search would have to start all over again. There are not many homes which can meet her needs. While it was not known how many there were or where she would have to go, it was very clear to the doctor who gave evidence that she would have to go to a different city. And the Vice President has been clear in this case to repeat that he regards the need for G to go to a care home as an essential and only possible route to her to achieving a, family, a home with, with her family, which he regards as the end goal. Yes. And so what we do say is that the injunctions that, are, that were sought and imposed need to be seen within that context. I'm reminded of one, one very small point about Section 16.5, which arises in response to um, your Lordship's question yesterday about the further orders um, after, in, in the, December judge, the December order after the two decisions were made. There are a number of orders setting out best interests meetings and things like that. And, and um, just for completeness, the official solicitor would say that those are not necessarily Section 16.5 orders. Those are properly considered case management orders made under Section right. 47. Right. So um, I think that deals with the overall question of factual matters. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on? Um, I think it's on, on the fact, general matters. Do you have any submissions on any of the specific issues raised on behalf of the appellants? 
um, the additional ones apart from the injunction point. <coughs> I'm not inviting you to say anything no. unless you do, but I'm just. So we have, for example, the hearsay evidence point. We have the fairness arguments put forward by Mr. Brownhill. Um, we have the we have the well those sort of points. Yeah, no, I I, I understand um, your point. Um, the the majority of what we have to say about those is, it right? um, is in writing. Um, the only additional point, perhaps, to make in respect of the hearsay <coughs> argument, given that I wasn't in the court below. Apart from the fact that we say essentially that was dealt with and contextualised and I've covered that in our, in our scopes. Um, it is in respect of the tampering um, allegations which Mr McKendrick referred to. Um, if I could briefly take you back to the judgment. <coughs> one which has the missing paragraph number 18. Yes, it's uh, on so page 118119. It's on page one, yes. And paragraph <coughs> 18, as I understand it... Yeah, the one that the, begins with the word during. Uh, yes, it's the one that should have a paragraph 18, number yeah. 18 at the, at the front of it. Um, as I understood it then and as I understand it now, what was being said there was that, as a matter of fact, a number of um, odd things had happened to G's equipment. Yeah. Um, and the nurse in this particular case reports the reaction of the father to the staff saying that it was suspicious that these incidents had happened. Um, I don't think that should read a DG order had been placed. I think that sh should read a DNA CPR. Well, I wonder what that meant. Well, the order that was made on the 8th of December was a was, was DNA R. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, yes. I, I don't know how that's arrived in, in the judgment in that form. Mis misprint. Happens in all judgments. Yeah. Um, DNA then. Yeah. Yeah. So. DNA rather. Sorry. Yes. That was. That, as I understand it, was, was the father's position and the hospital's position was, again, these things have happened, we do not know why, and the, the evidence before the court was we have put in place an HCA to be it by the bedside at all, at all the times, and since then everything has been fine. So without going into what had happened, whose fault it was, whether it was anyone's fault, um, as far as the trust was concerned, the matter was dealt with. And the vice president uh, was concerned at what was being raised because he said that this was a potential safeguarding measure. Yeah. But he accepted, as the official solicitor accepted, that on the evidence uh, available there was no further that he was either being invited to go or should go. If he had chosen to infer from the evidence, and I think this is what Mr. McKendrick was driving at yesterday. <coughs> If he had inferred that there was any realistic possibility that either staff or the family were responsible for tampering with the equipment, firstly, he would have said so expressly, and he says expressly says the opposite. Uh, paragraph 38. But he would also have had to take further steps to ensure that similar things did not happen when G was discharged as a care head. Because the HCAs that were in place are clearly only, were, were only a measure that, that applied at the hospital. There's no requirement for supervised contact. So on that point, we say it simply doesn't make sense that he could have placed any weight on an allegation of tampering if it was there. And, and on my reading of section 80, of paragraph 18 of Nurse T's statement, it is not there in any event.
he would have taken further steps. He could have. Um, I, I, I don't think I need to make any further submissions on the um, on the argument raised by the mother as to the findings that were made. Uh, on that, we would say the, the judge reached a conclusion on all the evidence. I'm able to assist the lawyer. No, well, you, in, what you adopt what Mr. Malena says on that. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, the, I, I, I know I'm not being invited to um, say anything about protection from harassment. No. Don't. Um, it was suggested by Mr. Brownhill yesterday that if he is in a care home and the family become difficult, the court would be not able to regulate behaviour between the family and staff. And we do not agree with that. We say that is precisely what the court can do and often does do. Um, and there are innumerable judgments which would triple the length of the authorities to form the Yes. Um, we do say, in case it persists, process of thinking that the position would be different if he left the care home and if, an, um, if a difficult family member was still so hostile to, uh, to whatever had happened in the care home that they carried on behaving in a difficult way to the care home. Uh, that may sound implausible, but I have certainly had well, that, in those cases, cases that's happened. In the, yes. And that happens in family cases too. The, the yes. powers to make orders does, of them don't. There are no powers under the, the protective jurisdiction. No. But that it doesn't do anything for P. No. Because it's not necessary or, for P. And so there are no powers. And so, and so you have to go. Then you do have to go off to a different jurisdiction. Yes. Um, and, and the I think the last point that is being made and. And perhaps trouble your lordships this morning, made by the grandmother, is in terms of the fairness of the process. Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, ver I'm very happy to speak to any of, of the other council to try and thrash out precisely what happened. I have some of the email trails which roughly support what Mr. Mylonas was saying, but I don't think I am likely to have anything like. Well, Ooh. what it looks as it looks as though the grandmother didn't have, wasn't served until. Although the, the notice is dated 26th of April, yes. she wasn't served till the beginning of at the beginning of June. She may have had some inkling of it on an email, but she wasn't served at the beginning of yes. June. The oh. or, the order that she with which which, which accompanied it, well, we made various points going through it about how she wasn't identified by name. Yes, and I don't. Mr. Malo Mr. Malone's point is that the his point is that the. the Evidence which ultimately led the judge, the judge focused on when he, in his judgment about the grandmother, only emerged in the course of the hearing, or substantially emerged in the course of the hearing. And he referred particularly to the email to the publicity agent. Yes, my lord, and, and, and that is my from, a, from the publicity agent. So sorry. Um, the, I've seen various emails, they're all um, from solicitors rather than anyone else, but the, I, I've seen correspondence which suggests that those instructing Mr. Mylonis and then Ms. Powell were trying to get contact details for uh, the grandmother and, um, and were told, I've certainly seen one email from a father's solicitors which says that they, they did not have permission to share those details with the trust, so, trust solicitor. Now there may well be other emails, so I don't want to say that that's in, in any way the entire picture. Um, but in terms of what then happened once she had been served? Um, from from my recollection, she she certainly didn't attend the whole of the hearing because she had um, she had chosen to remain at the hospital. She was a, a, a parent attending remotely, wasn't she? She appeared remotely to give evidence, and I don't think she appeared even remotely at any other point except okay. where she was giving evidence. Um, she, it is. It is I, I suspect Mr. Brown will have better. But she wasn't there for the whole hearing. I don't think she was there for the whole hearing. I think there may have been an issue about her following the hearing um, from the bedside. 
Yeah. That's Miss Baker's recollection as well, and I'm afraid these are just okay. our you know, comprehensively faulty recollections. So she was on a mobile phone. Um, I, I, I think she well she had a she, she had a Teams link, so she, when she gave evidence, she was giving evidence by by video link. The recital to the order says that she is unrepresented but attends attending to give evidence remotely. Yes. Which suggests that she only attended to give evidence. I, I think it, I think she, I think that is right, and what I can't remember is whether she she may have made there may have been points where she where she sought to attend at other at, at other points, but but didn't because she did she didn't have a private space in which to do so. If if she, if she was only there for the purpose of giving evidence, then she wasn't there. Then when the order was made joining her, um, I I can't recall whether she was made there were there when the order was made joining her. She had at some point during the hearing. After the hearing had started, she um, she filed quite an extensive witness statement, which was referred to your lordships yesterday, and which I think you yes. identified in the one book. Was that yes? When was that filed? Um, it was sent directly to the vice president's clerk, and I I think it took quite a long time for it to get to us. <laughs> That's also well. Was it filed there. before the hearing? No, my lord. Um, it, You'll give me a, a minute so I can find out precisely when it was filed. That's the, judge, that's the judge's clerk. That's the judge's clerk right, eh? to, yes. to all of us on Thursday the 9th of June at 10.30, which would have been as we were going into court. A.M. A.M., yes. Which says, please, dear all, please find attached the COP9 and COP24 documents submitted by the grandmother's name. Um, and what I have attached to that is the COP9, which... Um, I've asked to be printed and brought up. I'm not quite sure what that happened to your iPad. Um, sorry. Um, so there is a COP9 form. Yes, that's the application? Yes. Just so everybody knows, COP9 is the application. Sorry. Yes. There is a COP24 form, and then there are two Word documents, one of which is okay. her witness statement, and the other one of which is, her exhibit, is the exhibit to the witness statement. Okay. What's the top, COP24? COP24 is a, uh, a four-page cover sheet which is provided to, uh, to attach a witness statement oh, to. That's what we have in the bundle. Yes, it's a fairly cumbersome paper-wasting um, exercise. But, but it, it's so the lengthy statement was, f was filed, the lengthy statement during the hearing, Yes. precisely when you don't know, but it was sent to you on the, uh, presumably it was Agatha would have sent it as soon as she got it. Or as soon as I've got it, more or less, uh, on the morning of the morning. Well, don't worry about it, doesn't matter exactly when it was. No, it was due, sent, on the, sent to the other parties. Okay. Just for complete completeness, I can also see from my emails that that, that, um, that I had e emailed the judge, the Ms. Addington, uh, earlier that de day. I think that was in response to something we were told by Mr. Okay, so, but anyway, it, was, it looks like it was overnight. Eight, I think it was overnight. Okay. Um, and and both I and Ms. Powell contacted <coughs> Ms. Addington to say we gathered this has been filed and we haven't seen it and could we have a copy? And okay. That's been sent to us. Okay. Well, I that think that's as much detail two. as we know about that. Did the judge express any um, concerns or raise any questions with counsel about the position of the grandmother? Not from my recollection.
when she um, she had previously given a statement. Um, there was a, dis a statement from her which she had given before the hearing in December. So he would not have thought of her any more than the official solicitor did as a, as a newcomer <coughs> to the proceedings. And I think, as Mr. Mylonis said, there had been some involvement in the intervening hearing about the reporting restriction order. Um, although, again, she wasn't, she wasn't a party to that because that was an application made by the father to lift the reporting restriction. Um, yeah. And I think it, it's fair to say, as Mr. Mylonis does, that she came into into sharper focus at that stage um, because of the social media. She, she was, uh, she gave evidence about that point as well. That she was the one who was in charge of the social media agent about about you. Um, so she, I think it is fair to say that she did not appear as someone who knew nothing of the proceedings. And she had had some prior involvement. And as far as we knew, that is only as far as I knew, that it was, of course, broadly aware of, of the nature of the proceedings. And what you're saying that um, remotely and unrepresented, she gave quite a lot of em evidence which was extremely damaging to her resistance to the injunction. Um, I, Yes, I think that's, that is, is, is probably fair. Her, her statement was, um, her, both her statement and her oral evidence made it clear that she was opposed to the judge's decision in December. Um, as, as in all the family were, were very clear that they remained opposed to that decision. Um, and her written statement says in terms that she um, that she asks the judge effectively to remake the decision, to go back over and unmake his previous best interest decision and make a different one. Unless there's anything else I can assist you. Anything else? Anything else? Thank you very much, Ms. Roper. Thank you very much. Now, I think we uh, all three appellants have a right of reply. Uh, you can go first, Mr. Peter. <coughs> no, no, thank you very much. Just in terms of the grandmother's chronology, I have a note from my instructing solicitors. The application, as we know, was the 26th of April. Those instructing me wrote to the trust on the 28th of April, asking for the mother and grandmother to be served. Just a moment. Application, 26th of April. 28th of April. Over the father's right. solicitors write to trust, saying you've got to serve it on the mother yes. and grandmother. Yeah. On the 13th of May, the trust solicitors come back and ask for grandmother and mother's contact details. Yeah. <coughs> On the 18th of May, my instructing solicitors provided the mother's contact details but they did not have the permission of the grandmother to forward hers. My instructing solicitor also points out in her note that the trust would already have the postal addresses because they are on statements dated the 16th of November 2021. These proceedings have produced a lot of paper, so it would be understandable that that wasn't necessarily immediately to hand or found. Statements dated 16th of November 2021, my lord. Filed and prior to the earlier hearing. Yes, I suspect they were filed in support of what was then responded father's position by the mother and the grandmother mm -hmm. of the December hearing. Yes, thank you. Uh, in, in just trying to deal with matters fairly shortly, um, in terms of what did the judge decide, um, what was squarely before him from my written and oral submissions was that his lordship had to make the decision pursuant to section 47 and 37 and he did not have the power to do it under section 16.5. That's the issue that I uh, 
um, raised before the judge. And therefore, when one reads paragraphs 9 and 10, in my submission, it's very clear he rejected my submission, made the injunction pursuant to section 16.5, and as he said, strictly, he didn't have to consider the just and convenient principles because he was making the decision under section 16.5. Was he really looking at the power, or as uh, uh, about or about the, the, the extent of? Sorry, I'll start again. Was he looking? With, was he focusing on the? Or were you and he focusing on the on the on the statutory basis for the injunctive power, or on what he could do? Because your case, what he focuses on are two points. Yes, I know we've gone over this, but it's become clearer in the respondent's arguments. He focused on the two, first of all you said you can't do anything under 16.5 that doesn't relate to deputies. We've dealt with that. Um, and, th and then your second point that he focused on was that you can't make it injunctions of the sort that are required, uh, are being sought here, regulating behaviour with the care, with the care home staff, because that's precluded by the case law under section 37. No, that's right. The, the first point goes straight to section 16.5. The submission was necessary expedient was too low a test, and that wasn't the correct test to grant an injunction. It had to be section 47.37, just inconvenient, because that captured the case law which led to the submission that well, you're not. You're not. And he be. he rejected it. First of all, he said section sixteen five gives me whatever all the powers I want. Yes. Uh, consequently, the case law under section forty seven is irrelevant. But yes. even if it is relevant, Mr. McKendrick's wrong yes. because of what the law said in Holyoke. That's or, right. Or following on from what the law said. That's right. Holyoke, yeah. yeah. Uh, about equitable. Well, his point is about equitable rights. That's right. Lord. There is, on any view, G has an equitable right which is being protected. That's, that was the, that's the decision I say the, the judgment reflects and what the judge made and reflects the nature of the argument in writing and in oral submissions okay. on the fourth day of the hearing. Right. Turning then, if my lords will indulge me for a little longer, back to section 16 of the Mental Capacity Act. Yes. And can I just, I, I, I raised the issue of a uh, decision of Mrs. Justice Leaven, which was the follow on decision from my Lord Lord Justice Baker's decision in P removal of the party. Yes. A and so I have a copy of Mrs. Justice Leaven's decision and also a copy of the decision of Lord Justice Peter Jackson and F, a child adjournment. May I hand those up? Have you tipped? Uh, your colleagues off the They all course. have copies, and the paragraph numbers I'll refer to. Thank you very much. Yes, thank we you. have copies of those. Thank you very much. I will do it briefly. Take up too much time. If I may ask. Five to one. So, would it be how much of this are you going to want us to read? Yeah, not a huge amount. Um, no, certainly not of the, the first decision. The first decision is um, an appeal. A, a, and I can take the point on this case very shortly. The judge below. This is uh, uh, Lord, uh, Lord Justice Peter Jackson. My Lord, yes. Um, yep. Hearing an appeal, uh, and he was hearing a an appeal from a case management decision not to adjourn a 10 day trial considering adoption or placement issues because the mother was pregnant. That was the, the basis of the application. The judge below rejected and said it was in the child's best interests to get on with things and not yes. have any delay. And the paragraph I ask the court to consider is paragraph 
one can have a best interest decision which is an unjust. The analysis of a child, and by analogy, an adult's best interests does not always accord with justice. And that's important, we say, because for the reasons I outlined yesterday, if a judge considering an application for injunction is applying Section 16.5, the judge is directing him or herself, by way of Section 16.3, the best interests in the Section 4 checklist. When they need to be considering the rich background of just and convenient, and therefore it is important for this court, in my respect to submission, to be clear that injunctions must balance the rights and interests of those who are being injuncted. And that is not the same as a best interest test. The other decision is a decision of Mrs. Justice Leaven, and that, my lord, or just speak, will remember, falls well, off. Are you going to want, if you're going to want us to read a bit more of that, Yes. We, might do right, we might do that now in the short term. My Lord, yes, of course. Um, I mean, the key paragraphs are really 29 to 20, around 37. 29 to 37. Well, we'll yes. read that. Can I just come back to in a minute or so? We've got oh, that cost a bit far. Is, you can make, of course you can make a best interest decision, a welfare decision that is unjust. It's possible to do that. But how can the court make an order that is unjust, either under the family procedure rules or under the court of protection rules, both of which is part of the overriding, their respective overriding objectives that the court must deal with this matter justly? Well, I'm, with respect, I'm not sure that's quite right. An order under section 16.5 is not a case management decision. And the overriding objective in the Court of Protection at Rule 1.12 says the court will seek to give effect to the overriding objective when it exercises any power under the rules or interprets any rule of practice direction. Section 16.5 decisions or Section 47 decisions are not powers under the rules or interpreting the rules of practice direction. So the, so the overriding objective, in fact, doesn't apply. And the ally point to that rule, is, rule, 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 rule. is rule is rule one in the in the, in the, in the bundle. Um, I, I, I forgot to check because my lord was I quoting from it the, yesterday, the, 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 but I'm not sure if all my lords okay, do rule, that. Rule, these rules have the overriding objective of enabling the court to deal with the case justly and at proportionate cost, having regard to the principles contained in the act. Yes. Two. The court will seek to give effect to the error objective when it exercises any power under the rules or interprets any rule or practice direction. Oh, yes. And then dealing with three, dealing with a case justly involves, it's include, includes various factors. Yes. But that, that doesn't apply, in my submission, to a substantive Section 16.5 best interest decision. It applies to the steps running up to it. It, it, it deals with adjournments, case management, Identification of issues. The overriding objective is to enable the court to deal with a case justly. Why doesn't that apply to substantive decisions as well? 1.1 1. 1 must be read with 1.12. The court will seek to give effect to the overriding objective when it carries out those functions. So when it says deal with a case justly, that must be read with the requirement to exercise it in respect of the rules. But it doesn't say in respect to a substantive best interest decision. And but that's the rule, but the, but the power under the rules, the rules govern the process by which the court makes its decisions on substantive issues. It, it, it deals with the, the procedure, my lord, yes. Your point is that it says you have to apply the overriding objective when exercising functions under the rules. But the function under Section 16.5 is not under the rules. It's under the that's it, my lord, yes. It's a substantive decision which must be guided by Section 4. And as, for example, we see in the Lord Justice Peter Jackson decision, a best, industry, a best interest decision may not be a just one. And, and there is a subtle difference in the three overriding objectives. And maybe we need to find these over lunch, but over complicating things. Okay, well, it's now one o'clock, so 
Well, go away and read Mr. Stephen. And we'll see you at 2 o'clock. Nice, my lord. Thank you.